Before we discuss operator protection, let's briefly discuss system and equipment grounding, bonding, and equipment grounding conductors. Fair warning, I am as eager to engage in a protracted discussion about NEC regulations as I am to throw stones at an angry hornet's nest. You cannot use anything in this or other lectures as professional electrical advice. Follow the rules. Follow the code. It's there for a reason, to protect people and property from fire and electrical hazards. In addition to serving as a handy reference point for voltage measurements, ground actually serves as a means of protecting people from becoming an inadvertent path for electrical current. Intentional grounding is the purposeful introduction of a ground connection to ensure the safety of operators and the proper operation and protection devices like circuit breakers and fuses. Unintentional grounding, in contrast, is a fault condition and needs to be quickly detected and resolved by circuit protection devices. Allow me to demonstrate. Consider a negatively grounded 120 volt source and an electrical device modeled as a 60 ohm resistor. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates the device draws two amps of current while in operation. Given the current drawn by the device is below the rated current, the circuit breaker remains closed and the device functions as intended. By referencing the negative terminal of the voltage source to ground, this is known as system grounding. Let's say this device is mounted in an electrically conductive metal frame. This could be a washing machine, a kitchen appliance, a motor, or anything electrical meant to interact with humans. The innards contain the electrically active components not safe to touch whereas the frame and buttons servicing the machine should ideally remain electrically neutral and safe to touch. If a conductor servicing the electrical innards of the machine accidentally made contact with a conductive frame, the frame would now be energized. If the frame did not have a return path to the source, let's say because it's resting on rubber feet or an insulating pad, it's sitting there like a 120 volt snake, coiled and waiting, ready to bite the next person that tries to touch it. Any unfortunate person Bridging the accidentally electrified frame and ground completes a conductive path. Let's say this unfortunate person draws 30 milliampers of current, an extremely dangerous, painful, and damaging amount. The source supplies 2 amps to the device and 30 milliampers to the operator for a total of 2.03 amps. Despite this dangerous occurrence, the rated current of the circuit breaker servicing this machine is not exceeded and the circuit breaker will not trip despite the obvious safety hazard. Again, a traditional circuit breaker only protects the system from overcurrent events typically associated with short circuits. A very simple modification to this system could prevent such an unfortunate occurrence from ever occurring. The simple modification is the other aspect of grounding, known as equipment grounding. An extra wire, known as an equipment grounding conductor, intentionally connects the device's conductive frame to ground. In this case, the frame is additionally bonded, which is the permanent establishment of a low resistance path to ground for something like a frame that doesn't normally carry current. With the system and equipment grounded in this fashion, if an uninsulated energized wire does happen to make contact with a conductive frame, there now exists an extremely low resistance path to ground. High voltage, low resistance. The circuit breaker immediately opens because current quickly exceeds the rated value. The accidentally energized frame is immediately de-energized, saving the operator and system from damage. In addition to saving operators from inadvertent shock hazards, the equipment grounding conductor, by electrically connecting the frame to the reference plane upon which operators stand, also limits something known as a touch voltage to that same ground potential. This allows any accumulated static charge on a device to bleed off to ground. In summary, bonding the frame to ground purposely creates a low resistance path to ground so overcurrent protection devices like fuses and circuit breakers can operate it as intended and operators always touch things at the same potential as that which they are quite literally standing on. While system and equipment grounding does keep the external frame of devices touch safe, it should be noted that it does not protect an operator if they accidentally make contact with the energized electrical innards of the device. Let's say the device draws two amps as previously and an operator reaches inside the electrically neutral frame and touches the energized electrical innards. Let's say this unfortunate person completing a path draws 30 milliampers of current in an extremely dangerous, painful, and damaging amount. As previously, despite this dangerous occurrence, the rated current of the circuit breaker servicing this machine is not exceeded and the circuit breaker will not trip. Again, a traditional circuit breaker only protects the system from overcurrent events associated with short circuits. It is for this reason ground fault circuit interrupters, or GFCIs, are employed. A GFCI is a special type of fast-acting circuit breaker 
designed to shut off electrical power in the event of an unintended leakage path to ground. It works by comparing the amount of current going to and returning from equipment along the circuit conductors. You'll note in this scenario, 2 amps plus 30 milliamperes or 2.03 amps is leaving the source positive terminal. However, only 2 amps is returning to the source negative terminal and 30 milliamperes is leaking through the operator to ground. A GFCI recognizes the imbalance between outgoing and incoming current and quickly opens the circuit, sparing the operator from further pain. The GFCI in this scenario acts like a traditional circuit breaker in that the open or closed state of the GFCI influences the fundamental on or off state of the system. However, GFCIs differ from a traditional circuit breaker in that instead of detecting unusually high current, the GFCI opens upon detection of an imbalance between outgoing and incoming current. Even a small difference on the order of 30 milliamperes in this example will make a tremendous difference to an operator's level of comfort. Before we move on to our last circuit protection device, the overload relay, allow me to reiterate a statement I made at the beginning of this lecture. You are a circuit protection device. The simple act of not doing stupid things ensures the safety of equipment, yourself, and coworkers. There are good ways and bad ways to build systems, and you need to be aware of potential safety hazards. Case in point, compare and contrast high side with low side switching. You will note a break or open anywhere in a series circuit halts all current flow through that series path. Perhaps one of the most important applications of this property is the ability to turn a circuit on or off at the flip of a switch. Consider a switch between the positive terminal of the source and the top of the electrical load. This is known as a high side switching arrangement where the state of the switch selectively connects or disconnects the series elements to the source. In summary, switch open, everything's off. Switch closed, everything's on. Alternatively, consider a switch between the bottom of the electrical load and the grounded negative terminal of the source. This is known as a low side switching arrangement where all series elements are always hooked to the source. However, the state of the switch selectively connects or disconnects the return path to the grounded negative terminal of the source. As previously, switch open, everything's off, switch closed, everything's on. Although low side switching arrangements are functionally equivalent to high side switching arrangements, they are perhaps not the safest means of doing so. Allow me to demonstrate. Compare and contrast the behavior of these two systems when some errant conductive object accidentally makes contact with the electrical load and ground. Let's say this electrical load is some motor designed to cut a full grown dug fur into a thousand toothpicks. Obviously a device you want to keep an eye on when working in or around it. For obvious reasons, the switch needs to be open to ensure the device doesn't suddenly jump to life. In the high side switch derangement, an accidental connection of the load to ground does not energize the load because the load is already at ground potential due to the system ground connection and open switch. Not so in the low side switch derangement. The electrical load is always connected to the source and only necessitates a connection to ground to run. Any errant connection to ground can energize the electrical load even if the low side switch is open. Be extremely careful when working around low side switched elements. All right, now that we've got a basic understanding of fuses, circuit breakers, system and equipment grounding, and GFCIs, let's introduce another related protection device known as an overload relay, which acts a little differently than the devices we've thus far discussed. An electrical overload is an event where a device draws higher than normal current, but below the rating of a chosen circuit breaker. If experienced only infrequently, an overload would be no cause for concern, but could become extremely hazardous if sustained for any length of time. An example of an overload condition might be an electrical saw hitting a knot in a piece of wood. If the circuit breaker was undersized, the system would experience what is called nuisance tripping, and every time the saw hit a knot in the wood, the circuit breaker would open and need to be reset. Not the most ideal of situations when saws are routinely asked to cut through imperfections in wood. Overload conditions only become harmful if they're sustained. For example, when a saw becomes bound in a piece of wood and you just let it sit there. High sustained current can heat up the wires and damage the insulation on motor windings. It is for this reason overload relays protect systems not from high current events associated with short circuits, but rather from sustained high current draw, where the key word is sustained. An overload relay will allow a motor or other device to briefly overload, but only for a given amount of time before it signals enough is enough. Motor starters, relays, and ladder logic are a little outside of the scope of our present level of understanding, and we'll return for a more thorough discussion of these concepts when we move into the motor control series much later. However, I would like to just touch on the basics of overload relays because they're pretty neat devices. The schematic symbol for an overload device looks like a pair of opposing question marks. Long story short, 
and overload is a detection device only, and it does not actually break connection to the source. The actual act of making and breaking connection is reserved for devices like circuit breakers and contactors, a type of heavy duty electrical switch. The overload in series simply tells the device under its direction to do so when it experiences a sustained overload condition. Here's a diagram of a three phase manual motor starter with integrated magnetic and overload elements. You note the schematic symbol is almost identical to a circuit breaker. Here the overload elements serve to detect sustained current draw and tells the contacts to break connection. Here's another system incorporating an overload relay in series with a magnetic contactor. Again, the overload elements only serve to detect sustained current draw. When this occurs, the overload relay tells the contactor to break connection via means of pilot control known as ladder logic. We'll examine ladder logic and motor control in later lectures. The means overload used to sense the success of current draw are pretty creative. One method uses a strip made out of two different metals, hence the name bimetallic strip, with two different expansion rates. When heated from excessive current draw, one side expands at a different rate and mechanically opens a switch. This normally closed switch, now being held open, tells the low voltage control circuit to open the high voltage contactor. A second method uses a metal alloy that passes directly from the solid state to the liquid state at a certain temperature without the malleable lumpy intermediary. The solid state retains a spring-loaded switch, but when it enters the liquid state, it lets a spring move and this switch is what again signals the control system to open the contactor. The third overload detection method uses digital means, think a really small computer, to monitor current and signal the control system in the event of a sustained high current. Overloads, regardless of their means of operation, after being triggered, need to be reset for the device to operate again. The overload, like a circuit breaker, and unlike a fuse, is a reusable device. Sometimes this reset is performed automatically, or it must be done so manually, requiring human intervention. The time period between triggering and automatic reset allows the overload element to cool. Due to the cumulative nature of heat, overloads that have been triggered once will trigger earlier subjected to the same overload. Repeated overloads are a clear sign the motor is undersized for the task. Do not think for a moment we're done discussing the overload relay. We'll return to a far more thorough discussion of motor starters, contactors, and overload relays in much later lectures in motor controls. For now, you can think of an overload as a circuit protection device that allows temporary excess current draw, yet signals another element to open if it detects sustained excessive current draw. In contrast, circuit breakers and fuses interrupt extreme current draw, typically associated with short circuits. This wraps up our discussion of common circuit protection devices. Let's compare and contrast the devices we covered one last time. Both fuses and circuit breakers open when current draw is in excess of the rated value. A fuse is expendable and reliable. Conversely, a circuit breaker is reusable, yet more complicated. System and equipment grounding ensures the proper operation of circuit protection devices like fuses and circuit breakers and ensures the external conductive surfaces of electrical devices remain touch safe. A GFCI is a special type of circuit breaker that detects imbalance between incoming and outgoing current in a circuit and interrupts the circuit if it detects leakage. Finally, an overload relay allows brief overloads but protects against sustained overloads. An overload relay is a detection device only and it signals another device, like a circuit breaker or a contactor, to actually make or break connection. Finally, finally, and most importantly, you are a circuit protection device. Pay attention to current. Always operate devices inside their intended range and avoid sustained overload conditions. Know where the emergency off switch is and make sure you've got access to it at all times. In conclusion, this lecture took a close look at basic circuit protection devices. We introduced fuses, circuit breakers, overloads, and GFCIs and discussed their intended purposes, means of operation, and differences between them. Additionally, we discussed the use of system and equipment grounding, bonding, and equipment grounding conductors used to protect people from electrocution hazards. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.